All right. Um, we will get started very quickly in terms of how uh, the format for uh, tonight's uh, proceedings. Um, all of the questions that you will ask will be directed to the minister. The minister will then call on all of the resource uh, persons uh, sitting at the head table uh, for backup, as it were. Um, we'll be here for about a couple of hours, uh, so we'll wrap up around 9.30 or so. So we'll ask that as you get up uh, to ask your question or to make a statement, be mindful of one, the time, also be mindful of uh, the person sitting next to you who might want an opportunity um, to ask a question or to make a statement. Um, we understand that you might want to create some context for the question that you would ask, uh, that you be brief um, in doing that. Uh, you didn't uh, really come here to hear me, so what I will do, uh, I'll turn the mic over now to the Honorable Minister, and he will make some opening remarks. Thank you, P.S. Good evening to everybody. I want to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues from the House of Assembly, member for the 8th District, Honorable Malam Penn, and the at-large member, the Honorable Archibald Christian. As we go through tonight's proceedings, I will give a brief overview of where we are with respect to the airport development, put some things in perspective, following my comments, we will then ask the managing director backed up by the Crowds Manning team to do a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation that will give you some of the technical details with respect to what is happening with the airport and what is being proposed. I want to start off by saying to you that the BVI has come to a fork in the road. We are at a point in our development, I said in the House of Assembly on Thursday last, the BVI now, like the rest of the world, we live in a post 9-11 world. And I went on to say that we also live in a pre-Caribbean Cuba. Puts the BVI at a fall. Post 9-11 and pre-Caribbean Cuba. And if you don't understand what that means, it means when Cuba finally opens up to the rest of the world, what the impact is going to have on the Caribbean. In 2005, as a government, we passed legislation to establish the BVI Airports Authority. BVI Airports Authority Act 2005. Subsequent to the establishment of that organization, which separated the operational side of the airport from the marketing side, the airport authority was asked to look at the overall master plan development for the future of the airport in the BVI. They then commissioned a study by the Louis Berger Group out of Washington, D.C. to look at the master plan development for the airports, all the airports in the BVI, looked at the proposed development of the Terence B. Letsom Airport and the future impact, etc. And this is the formal report that was submitted to the government of the Virgin Islands last year. I think it was submitted in July, June 2011. Out of that report, an uh, executive summary was prepared, which was prepared by the airports authority and submitted to the government, the sitting government of the day. This was done in July 2011 looking at all the recommendations that were made in this report by the Berger Group and recommending to the government what it should be paying particular attention to. As a result of that quite extensive study with respect to airports development, the Berger Group basically told the government that Anigata was not an option for putting an international airport based on their studies. That the only real place you could do an uh, international airport based on what was needed was to look at the possibility of extending the runway at B. Phylon. They went on to look at the different ways in which the airport could be extended and they came up with about, I think it's five or six different options that could be entertained for looking when you talk about the airport expansion. 
they narrowed it down to two options when they looked at all the pros and the cons of the different options that were on the table. And as you would see in the presentation a little bit later, they recommended what, was, what is referred to commonly both in this report and in the media as option four. The airports authority looked further at what the options was saying and asked them to review. And out of that review, another option, option six, was entertained. And so this executive summary that was prepared and sub submitted to the then Minister of Communication and Works under whose portfolio the airport development was at the time recommended that the two leading options for airport expansion were option four and option six, as you will see in the report, as, as you see the PowerPoint presentation later on. Now let me say a couple of things, because I've been reading, I pay careful attention to what is being said in the public media and what is written in the newspapers, etc., etc. Let me Let me make one point clear from the very beginning. The government of the day campaign about the whole question of the upgrade expansion of the TB Letstam International Airport. The government of the day, the sitting government of which I'm a part, have had a formal presentation based on all of this information from the airport's authority to look at the information. We have made a decision that we are going to expand the airport. That decision is made. It's not, I didn't come here tonight to ask if we're going to expand the airport. The decision to expand the airport has already been taken. We have come to a point in the overall discussion where Kraus Manning won the bid to look at the environmental impact assessment, what it means if you're going to expand the airport. Now, let us be clear about something. The government has made a decision to expand the airport, but no other decision has been made beyond that. That decision puts us in a position now where we have to do the other research that will tell us how to do it if we are going to move forward. Krauss Manning has the contract to do the environmental impact assessment and their report is scheduled to be submitted to the airport's authority, ultimately to the government of the Virgin Islands by the end of April. Now they didn't give me permission to do this, but I'm going to tell you that they have submitted to me already as the minister responsible for the subject preliminary findings of their research thus far. I want to also make it abundantly clear as, you, as we go through this, this discussion this evening that this government of which I am a part of and as the sitting minister responsible for the subject, not only responsible for the airport development but responsible for the environment as a whole, this government will do no development that will adversely impact the environment. I want to make that abundantly clear that this government will do no development that is going to adversely affect the environment. So those of you who are worried about Trailers Bay don't need to be worried about Trailers Bay. This government will not destroy Trailers Bay. We understand that the extension of the airport will have an impact on Trailers Bay. We understand that. And so we have, we have, we have employed people who have the expertise the technical knowledge and are doing the research to tell us how to mitigate against the impact on Trailers Bay. I want everyone here sitting to understand that, that from an environmental impact point of view. What's the problem? Listen, if you're going to disturb the meeting, please, please. Okay, this, this government will not do anything that is going to destroy the environment. I want to make that abundantly clear. So let's put that in perspective as we go forward, okay? Our country has come to a point in its development where all the research that we have done with respect to the overall improvement in our tourism product tells us that one of the most important issues that we have to contend with is the issue of airlift, access to the BVI. All the research that we have done so far tells us that if we don't attend to that, our tourism product will remain stagnant and we are likely to fall further and further behind. And so, as we have studied this subject, both the former government and this government have studied this subject, we've come to the point where we realize that we've got to improve on the access to the country. 
I know all, I've heard all the stories about St. Thomas and what, what that means. What, let me just say this again and make it abundantly clear. Ports, when you're talking about ports, whether airports or seaports, are sovereign issues. I want you to understand that it's a sovereign issue. This is a nation that we are building. And we can't build a nation depending on another nation to make our nation what it ought to be. And so we have to do what is important to us as a country, as a people, as a government to ensure that our country moves forward as independently as it can. So I understand, I hear all the discussion, I hear all the stories about what we should do with St. Thomas and what we shouldn't do with St. Thomas. Those are interim measures. Looking forward to the future development of our country 20, 25 years down the road, we have no choice but to build and improve our airport facilities. And if you have any doubts about what is happening in the wall around you, if you didn't see it, Yesterday's daily news on the front page, American Eagle pulling out. If you haven't seen it or if you haven't heard it yet, front page yesterday, daily news, that come March 2013, American Eagle is no more. So all the flights to St. Thomas, St. Croix, it's going to close its hub in San Juan. And so American Eagle will be no more. I, know, I think I, your minds could start drifting as to exactly what that means for us in the Virgin Islands. If we are going to move forward, we've come to a point in our development where our airport and its development is critical for us as a country if our economy is going to grow. And so against that background, I want you to understand why we are here tonight. As a part of the Planning Act, it is mandated that we have to have public meetings to discuss projects of this magnitude. Part of cross manning's remit is that they have to entertain discussions with the public and Dr. Bertie Harrigan is doing the social impact assessment of the airport and the wider community. And so they are going to be handing out a survey at the end of this meeting also to ensure that feedback that they can get to help look at the problems and mitigate against them are also taken into consideration. And as a government, we promise that we will do things as transparent as possible and I have no problems with conducting public meetings of this nature. So we are killing three birds with one stone this evening as we have these public meetings. Okay? So I'm going to shut up at this point in time. I'm going to ask Mr. Dennis, Mr. Dennis Dunn Fraser, the Managing Director, along with the team of the airport, uh, the, the Cross Manning, to now do the PowerPoint presentation that will give you some additional information with respect to the technical details of the airport. Then after that, we will entertain questions and the discussions for the rest of the evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Pickering. And I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of the member for the 8th, Honorable Marlon Penn, the at-large representative, uh, Mr. Archibald, Honorable Archibald Christian, and I've seen just walked in the front is Honorable Dolores Christopher, member for the 5th. Good evening, all. All right, and just walking in, I'd like to recognize you, sir, Honorable Myron Walwyn, Minister for Education and Culture. Good evening to everyone, media personnel. Assisting me tonight will be Mr. Lyle Flax. We just have, I think it's about 34 slides we're going to go through very quickly, well, timely. And um, as was said more than once, I think we will entertain your questions at the end and the questions of course would be directed to the Honorable Kedrick Pickering. All right. So I'm going to give a brief overview right now, introduction um, done, the current situation, speak a little bit about the Airport Development Committee, talk about option one through five, then we're going to get into the option four and six which are the, the leading options, some advantages and disadvantages of both. We're going to mention some costs. Uh, talk a bit, little bit of financing as well. Next slide. All right, as we have it there, uh, our current runway as you know it, uh, this runway, uh, next slide, we have a displaced threshold. Most of you would know uh, the current touchdown area is just about this area right there and it's not actually at the very end. It's by the white markers. We, also, we have actually 3,000 957 feet for landing. Uh, I know that, that surprised quite a few persons. We, we're thinking that we have at least 5,000 or 4,000 something. Landing, we have available only 3,957. 
The total takeoff distance area on runway 7 is 1356 meters or 4,449 feet. Uh, that's runway 7 landing towards, that's taken off towards the east as we normally would go. And then we have a takeoff distance of 4,154 feet towards the west. That's taken off towards the west. All right, as was mentioned, the Louis Berger Group was contracted in 2008 to develop a master plan for the TV, uh, for the national airport system of the country generally. And conceptually, this idea was uh, in mind from the time the BVA Airports Authority took over in 2005. Uh, we've had tendering process, I think there was about four to five different uh, tenderers and the Louis Berger Group from Washington DC was the uh, successful tenderer. So that report was issued last year, July 2001, the final master plan report. The master plan recommended option four, and we'll go through those options later. The master plan addressed the terminal expansion and the ramp accommodation as well for option four. Option six, which is the second leading option we're going to discuss tonight, was introduced on the recommendation of the Airport Development Committee. The Airport Development Committee was primarily our operations team, headed by Mr. Coy Levens and his team, duty manager Lyle Flax, Dorinda Ham, and uh, we also have Clive Smith. So this report will focus on options four and six. The critical factors in the master plan uh, by Louis Berger, they addressed the runway alignment, the aircraft type, we looked at environmental considerations, social impact, the weather conditions, financial feasibility, and of course, passenger forecast. These were all looked at with, from Louis Berger. Now, just to give a bit of history as to how we get up to this point, option four and six, we'll just go through the options quickly and then focus on four and six. Option one, this was the recommendation for option one, had an additional length of 492.5 feet, given a total new runway length of 4,874 feet. Number of runways, one, uh, meaning in terms of runway strip, and maintaining the same orientation. I think we could see why, if you stay with option one, thanks. If you think you could see why this option was quickly discarded and everyone would agree this was just a mere uh, 500 feet filling up the sea here. What, what could we really accomplish with that? Not, not much. I mean, this, this really was not forward looking. Option two, and I must mention here, all the areas in the, um, what's that? Rust, not rust, um, not beige, kind of green color. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm lost for colors here. Um, lilac, thank you. All the areas in, in that, the, this particular color would be fill, would actually be um, landfill, dirt, you know, sand, um, be, be it may, uh, whatever, in the sea here. So this would be option two with a new runway length of 6,166 feet. Again, the one runway strip, runway orientation remains the same, heading 070 and 250. And of course, this particular runway, according to Louis Berger, would attract the 737, 700 direct from Miami. I'm sorry? All right. Um, again, if you could just keep the comments and the questions until the end. I, un I understand that we need 7,000, but if you could just keep the comments until the end, we we'll really appreciate that. The option three, uh, basically, it's an extension of option two, given a new runway length of 8,694 feet. Same uh, orientation. Same orientation, 07. I really would appreciate the absence of competition from someone yelling in the crowd. And if we need to call, um, to station just down the line. Okay, continuing. The runway orientation of this, again, is um, 
same, same orientation, 07025. This one will attract a slightly bigger 737, 800 series directly from Miami before you change. Uh, again, um, you would notice that this, the impact that this would have, it, it's gone. It's a wide footprint. And I think my battery, okay. It's a wider footprint which comes very close to the to the Spratt Point area for uh, that that would create a very narrow pathway into Trellis Bay. Let's go to option four. Option four, which is the one recommended by Louis Borgia. And I apologize, my pointer is acting up, I think. Uh, this one was recommended by Louis Borgia at 4,449 feet, uh, the new runway length. Okay, um, that, that's, that's an error there. My apologies. The, the, the new length is actually 6,068 feet. Ignore the top one. The number of runways, two, two runways, uh, meaning that we'll have the new uh, oriented runway at the heading of 060, and we'll also maintain the original runway. Uh, 070. So we'll have basically two runway strips there. Again, this would uh, accommodate the Boeing 737-700 direct from Miami and Atlanta. We'll talk a little bit about that some more. Option 5 was an extension of option 4, same uh, crossed runway basically across the current one, and it extends from that 6,000, it extends out to 8,000 8,694 feet. Again, please ignore this top number here. 8,694.2 feet, and it extends this additional uh, piece to the northeast. Two runways, uh, two different orientations, and this one again would accommodate the slightly bigger 737-800 series from Miami or Atlanta. So the consultant's preferred option was option four. Uh, that that would be the best option for Beef Island. Uh, in particular, the consultant looked at the capacity of aircraft movements. They looked at the environmental impact, the potential as required by demand, and the financial feasibility. Now, the board, the, the BVA Airports Authority board, also concurred with Louis Borgia in, in looking at the document. Uh, with option four, but they recommended that that option be further evaluated, mainly based on environmental concerns, because as you can see here, the environmental concerns, this is the pond on Beef Island, and all this area would be filled, basically, and graded, so the pond would be gone, and you could see the infringement on the beach there, on the north of uh, Long Bay Beach there on the north side. So the board asked to, uh, the, uh, that we further evaluate this particular option, looking at the environmental concerns. Next slide. Uh, so that's where the Airport Development Committee uh, came to be. And the Airport Development Committee came up, look, basically they looked at environmental concerns, high developmental costs, instrument runway uh, that was recommended on the option four, looked at the runway orientation, clear and graded areas, runway length, and in particular, which is something we're studying right now, the approach, and I know that has been a concern of even the public, um, you know, approach towards the, the current runway, which would remain in, in this length. The, the Airport Development Committee, in their consultation, did contact uh, Air Canada, Delta Airlines, JetBlue, and I know there were a few more, Miami Air and so forth, airlines, major airlines, in terms of uh, coming up with their option, uh, seeking their advice and professional uh, advice, basically, especially on the approach. They're working with us on the approach. Um, right now, we've, been, we've, we've consulted a company from the UK, uh, Davison, who is looking at the approach in terms of getting us a particular GPS approach, a special GPS approach for landing at Beef Island. They, of course, consulted ASI, the Air Safety Support International, a uh, name that has become quite familiar to us now. They are the regulators of aviation here in the BVI at this time. 
Uh, I mentioned Satnav. Satnav is well. I mentioned Davison. Satnav was pre-Davison. Satnav is a an approach uh, company, approach uh, designer company from the UK. We started out with Satnav. Uh, we've ended up with Davison. Uh, some technicalities there, but Davison is now uh, going ahead and reviewing uh, that the particular approach. The committee have also, of course, uh, at least two or three of them are pilots themselves, but in addition to themselves, they've contacted other local pilots and regional pilots on, in their consultation. So here we have it, a bigger version of the Airport Development Committee recommendation, option six, which takes the runway to 7,000 feet. And as you can see, this diagram was produced as well by Louis Bourgeois. I have two additional diagrams um, at the end of the presentation, which was done by the Kraussmann and team. But this is the Louis Bourgeois design of option six, 7,000 feet, uh, having a little over 1,000 feet to the east and 500 feet to the west. And as you could see the design, as you could see the design here. Next slide, please. Okay, this is, right. Okay, this is just some uh, technicalities here which I will not bore you with. I would just to say that this is straight out of Annex 14, the International Civil Aviation Organization's Annex, which is basically the international rules that govern uh, some aspects of the aspects of aviation. The recommendation here, and, and this, this was really considered in the option six. You would note that, and I will have a comparative diagram at the end with both option four and option six, but you'll note that option four is considerably narrower in footprint than option six is considerably narrower than option four and we were able to get away base with that basically because of this what we've created on option six was a non-instrument runway as opposed to option four an instrument runway was recommended with a non-instrument runway uh, based on the rules and guidelines we were able to actually have the runway strip to remain at 75 meters as we are right now at B file in the category of code four, code three, airport. So that's the reason we were able in simple terms to get away with a narrower strip for the option six. Next slide. Okay, we're gonna look basically at some of the advantages and disadvantages of the varied options. Option four, advantages. We have basically a straight in approach you would recognize as this is uh, shifted to the, as this is shifted towards the northeast, we would have a, a direct approach from the sea here. You'll recognize the east end hill in this area. You will have a direct approach from the sea. So that is, that is um, a straight in approach for option four. Uh, another advantage was the potential for expansion, whether you want to pull back this way or go forward. Um, to, to the northeast. Trellis Bay, of course, would be hardly affected, not to say it will not be, but it would be hardly affected in this option. Some of the disadvantages, however, again, next. Some of the disadvantages of option four, crosswind lang landings. Currently, uh, the, the aviation enthusiasts in this room would know that aircraft prefer to land into the wind. Uh, with a wind coming straight down the nose is the best way uh, for slowing up purposes, also for taking off, uh, they get better lift with the, the, the wind flying or uh, coming straight down the nose. Our wind, our predominant wind in Beef Island at, at this area is predominantly from the southeast coming up from a heading of 120 degrees this way. So we do have a slight uh, crosswind currently as it is with this particular runway. You would recognize that if we have to tilt that runway more to the northeast, it would actually increase that crosswind component, something that is not favorable, as I mentioned, for aircraft and landing. So that is uh, one disadvantage, the crosswind landings. Second one is the environmental impact. 
of course you could see this particular runway um, the pond is gone the beach is going to be affected so we have you know big environmental impact there wind shear as well wind shear actually is uh, uh, unfavorable wind for aircraft basically is where you have uh, a sudden change in direction and or speed in in the wind and if you're flying low and slow you don't want to have that you don't want to have wind coming from this from say your, your your headwind at one point and then all of a sudden it changes maybe it's coming this way at 10 knots and then all of a sudden it shifts behind you at 20 knots your slow speed landing, you don't want to have that. How we know that that is true? Um, the pilots here know that. The pilots would encounter that. They tell us about it. We have Mount Almo, I think it is, and B. Fallon, the tall hill, as you know, there with the light on in the night. As the wind um, comes over that hill and the eddies and so forth come across, it affects the, the aircraft on landing. And we have had reports and I've, I've known this personally as well, me flying into B. Fallon, as I said, pilots from the team, and um, also as an air traffic controller, I've encountered post uh, pilots letting me know that they have wind shear on final, especially when the wind is gusty over that hill. So we know that the wind shear component will even increase with the runway in this direction, which could create an unsafe condition for landing. Of course, the cost, the cost, and I have some um, slides about the cost later on. This cost would be much more than the option six. Some of the concerns with option four uh, was, would be the noise pollution at Scrub Island and Camano. Uh, we would have those uh, islands, as you know, in this area. Basically, this runway takes off and flies basically directly over Scrub Island. So we will have noise concern there. Um, and of course, any lengthening would further infringe water traffic and noise pollution, the water traffic that so travels so often across this area, it would infringe that as well as the noise pollution mentioned earlier. So this is a, a Google map of the area, Scrub Island here. By the way, the development that's taking place is right in this particular area. So you can see a runway takes off and it goes right over Scrub. Um, if with the change, you will have that noise. Option six. Option six, you've seen this before, accommodating the Airbus 319, Airbus 320, and the Embraer 190, as I said, 7,000 feet uh, in length. Um, some of the advantages next slide, with option six would, of course, be the reduced environmental impact. I mentioned earlier about the narrower strip. You notice it's much narrower than the other one. With this strip, you notice we have saved the pond and the beach with this particular option. So we will have a reduced environmental impact. Uh, we will have the reduced crosswinds as opposed to the runway crossing um, to, towards the northeast. We'll have reduced crosswind. And of course, we'll be able to accommodate uh, code C and code D aircraft. Some of the aircraft I mentioned earlier, the Airbus, Boeing 737, and so forth, and even the Boeing 757. Advantage, again, of course, is the cost. Uh, much cheaper. I have that slide I'll show you in a moment. The disadvantages that we have with uh, option six would be higher with the minimums. And I say higher with the minimums. Um, as, as the traffic lands, as the current uh, traffic would land um, as we have today, of course, you know, that will continue. This here re mostly refers to the uh, jet traffic, potential jet traffic that would come from the U.S. using that particular specialized approach I spoke about earlier. With that approach, uh, and that's yet to be finalized, but preliminary, what we've noticed is that we will have to use a height of at least 1,290 feet. It's up to change, but it's pretty high. You must be at that particular height and at about, I think it's somewhere just off of the college area, about a, a mile, a mile and a half off of the college. You must be at that particular spot at 12,000. 1290 feet at that point you must be visual with the runway in other words you must at least see the runway threshold at that particular point um, 
that is for those aircraft using that specific type of approach. Of course, like I said, the normal day-to-day -day traffic who would land and will not have to deal with that. They would will, they will come in uh, VFR or IFR as they would normally do today. Uh, other disadvantages, the circling approach. By that I mean, by that I mean the uh, particular approach in in this that, that I spoke about the GPS approach, there is a circling procedure which takes place just south of Norman Island. Uh, any aircraft coming from whether the east or from the west would have to enter that hold approach into Norman Island area before they actually come to land on the runway. Again, I, I mentioned that as a disadvantage, but um, and, and the only reason I mentioned that we know jets that they just don't like to circle, they don't like to stay in the air, they want to get on the ground as, as quick as possible, saving gas. Uh, so it may or may not be an, a disadvantage. Some of the issues or concerns that with option six basically is future widening has an environmental impact on trellis bay. That's if we uh, were to go to a future widening for whatever um, reason one day we wake up and say we want to have a widened runway, an instrument approach right down, which with the technology that's going nowadays, GPS approach is becoming more frequent and favorable where you have more precise approach procedures, um, that is hardly likely. But it's a concern that we thought would be fair and, and just mention it. If we were to go with a wider runway, we will have uh, the, the pond uh, being affected there. Um, also the future, uh, the pond and the trellis bay. Both the future widening will actually have a greater impact on trellis bay. As we saw in one of the older diagrams, I think it was option three, it was, it was a wide footprint coming, taking up even half of uh, last resort and of course the pond. So those are the, the two concerns with those, with those particular options. Uh, work in progress. I will just call on Cross Manning quickly at this point. Uh, Tony, he's going to give you uh, an overview of where they are with the impact assessment at this point. Hi there. Keeping it brief so that there's time for questions, we're currently undertaking the impact assessment based on the two options, four and six. We've got a well-qualified team of professionals working with us who are currently gathering data from the field. Our team includes environmentalists, coastal engineers, aviation consultants, socio and economic specialists, all of whom we've worked before, worked with before in the BVI and are well qualified. Our initial report on the impact of the runway extension will be published in the next few weeks. We are consulting all government agencies and interested parties to ensure that we leave no aspects unturned or investigated. There is a questionnaire at the back of the hall um, that uh, allows you to comment and a drop box to leave any um, issues that want you want to raise. Also a confidential email address uh, which you can send questions uh, to us, all of which will be answered as part of our assessment. Um, I'll leave uh, time now for questions after the next speaker. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, again, just to re-emphasize the, the question and answers, uh, that he has uh, a chart, you will pick that up and, and make sure you get that back to Cross Manning um, at, at the end or they mail it to you. They'll mail it, okay. All right, so Cross Manning is our impact assessment team. Cross Manning has been employed, I think it was in November last year, to conduct the impact assessment on both the socio-biological, human, social impact uh, of both options. And they're doing both options simultaneously, both options to a length of 7,000 feet. Uh, because, as I heard shouting in the back, we need 7,000, we need, seven, yeah, we know we need 7,000, and that's why we, we have actually increased the option four, which really was a 6,000 foot runway. And, and it's actually, now they're doing on, on both of them. The technical review uh, is, is a work in progress right now with IATA. Uh, 
Uh, Yato is doing a technical review, at, and that too is expected by the end of April. Approach charts, I mentioned Davidson from the UK is going to be there. When we built the Deepwater Harbor, the Deepwater the cruise ship here, shortly thereafter we decided and we realized that it was too short. We have a lot of ships that have pulled out from coming to this territory because of the length of the pair. We continue to do things for five years down the road. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I heard a lot of talk this evening. And all I'm hearing about is flights from Miami. What happened to Europe? What happened to, to the United States and the United States? Are we just thinking in terms of Miami? I hear us talking about 737 jets. We are limiting ourselves. I want to give you some statistics. I made a call today to Antigua because I wanted to get some figures. Up until about two years ago, the runway length in Antigua was 7,050 feet. And they accommodated British Airways 747 jet, most of the major um, carriers. About two years ago, they lengthened it on both ends, and then they have now have 9,973 feet. Now, I'm not saying that we must follow what Antigua do, but I'm saying that we should not limit ourselves to accept maybe 30, um, 737 jets and maybe 8,300 airbuses. We have to think, we have to look at the bigger picture. We have to think on what is good for the people of this country. We cannot think on certain individuals who may not want to see the development. And I know there are people here tonight who don't want to see that development. But it will happen. It must happen if we are to move forward. I feel very strong about this. And I am behind the, the proponents of this idea 110%. And I am, Dr. Pickering, I applaud you to see that you took the ball and ran with it. Honorable Fraser wanted to do it. But he had a lot of opposition. He had opposition. That's why it isn't further than it is right now. But I'm glad to see that this government, it doesn't matter what government holds office. If you are right, and I feel like you're right, I'm going to agree with you. And I agree with you, Dr. Pickering. I agree with you 110%. We need, as this gentleman just said, America is pulling out, and that is no secret. What are we going to do? I hear us talking about JetBlue and a few other airlines. We are not even mentioning British Airways, Air Canada. We can't just think on just coming from Miami. We have to think on the bigger picture. Flights coming in directly from Europe. The approach envelope is big enough. It's, we have a better situation here than St. Martin. When 747 Lufthansa, Lufthansa 747 takes off from St. Martin, as they lift off, they have to make a sharp right turn to get clear of that mountain. We have better situations here. We cannot let people who do not want to see the development dictate to us what we should be doing. We have to know what is best for us and this country. Thank you very much. Good evening. I would like to know if Virgin Atlantic have been approached since their CEO lives here. Um, another of my questions is, have the projected income been calculated for the territory? I mean, what the territory, the business people here, the restaurants and such, what would they gain from this expansion? Your, I smile at your first question. It, it's a work in progress, the answer to your first question. The answer to your second question is that is a part of the process in terms of the research that is unfolding as we speak. Remember I said that the whole environmental impact assessment is being undertaken by cross Manning. So coming out of this meeting, they will also take into consideration the issues and the questions that are raised 
to help furnish those answers. This is a part of the process that Krauss Manning itself has to undertake. So the, the answer to your question about the wider economic impact is to come. Available to all to actually read and look over before work starts. Are we going to be able to read full reports about economy and ecological impact, or is that going to be privy to the government? I I don't know. There'll be any reason to keep it public, um, keep it private. Um, so unless Klaus Manning has something in their in their remit that says strictly confidential. I don't know that the government will have any reason. The reason why government employs consultants and experts is so that government can be standing in a transparent position to say, well, this is what the experts have said. Louis Berger is one of the largest groups that deal with airport development in the United States. This is their work that they presented and told us the best way to move forward with airport development in the country. This is not our government. This is Louis Berger from Washington, D.C. And it, it's an extremely detailed piece of information. Krauss Manning will, this, this is a preliminary, something that Krauss Manning handed me the other day to, to get a briefing. I would expect that their, their, their presentation to government will be just as, as comprehensive as this. So I don't know that government would want to keep that sort of information private. It, that's the whole purpose of having these consultations so that government can stand and say, well, this is, this is what the consultant said we could or could not do. So I, as the minister, I don't have any reason to keep anything private. I want to see the best for my country. And I want to repeat myself again. There's nobody in this room who's more environmentalist than I am. And I presume that the gentleman who spoke about, about Bella McKee, I, I presume that he's one of the proprietors, and I did read your letter in the newspaper and on the internet. And I want to say to the owners of Bellamarkey that one of the remit of Krauss Manning is to see how best, how best we can develop the airport without having a direct impact on Bellamarkey. The government has no intention of destroying what goes on on Bellamarkey. That's not an issue that the government wants to deal with at all. We, we, we have told them specifically to see how best the development can proceed without impacting Trillers Bay in general. But I also want to remind the gentleman from Belmont Key, there used to be a restaurant at, on B. Fallon called Kong Shell. There used to be. First of all, I'd like to compen, uh, c uh, congratulate uh, <laughs> uh, the very nice presentation and the response to the brief that they were given. And it's been well thought out and is certainly, I'm sure, very feasible. The thing we have not heard about today are two important things. First of all, I would like to point out that the British Virgin Islands we have a citizenship, of which I'm very proud to be one, of about maybe 15,000 people living in this island. The balance of our population are here on work permits. They are not citizens. Secondly, you can fly any plane you like in there, but I have platinum on American Airlines, which means I have had for four years I fly over 50,000 miles a year with American Airlines. I know that they reduce the number of planes down until every seat is filled. It is total wishful thinking that we can bring in three airlines in here um, and fill every seat. We can't expand our tourist industry that much. The, the bear boat industry, the sailing, the, the boating industry is our major tourist industry. We don't have new bays. We don't have new anchorages. We, we, we are probably at capacity now 
That's why the moorings in Sunsail have expanded around the world, because they couldn't expand in the, any more in the BVI. We've reached saturation point. I would suggest what we should be spending our money on is increasing the quality of our tourism rather than, rather than trying to just bring in more people. Most of our tourists arrive by a bloody cruise ship boat and they don't spend any money and the economics when the Israeli firm who persuaded us to have a cruise ship dock did their feasibility study, and I've done hundreds of feasibility studies in my time, including one showing where the runway would be on Anagada, including drillings along the length of it. The Israelis projected when the cruise ship dock was put in that the cruise ship passengers would spend $138 per head per day, and that is over 25 years ago. The no we, we don't have the economics of it. I worked it out. If we spend 70,000, well, let, let's take it about 80, 18, 90,000 by the time it's finished, allowing for the inevitable escalations. And I'm not blaming, I've been building here for 50 years. I, I do know a little bit about what happens. The, what that actually comes down to is, basically, we would be, paying for this runway extension at the rate of a hundred thousand dollars a week a week that is about seven hundred and fifty dollars per capita of the BVI every day for the next 10, 15, 20 years I question whether we can afford that sort of expenditure. I would, I would fully support a shorter runway, an extension of the runway, so that we can bring in, we can have an, a very effective feeder aircraft. We should also be looking at the kind of aircraft, um, and we should also be looking at the fact that in St. Croix, which is 40 miles away, they have a 10,000 foot runway, seaborne fly in and out of uh, there to St. Thomas are going to be flying into North Sound. They also operate um, land-based planes. I have over 4,000 miles on seaborne flown between St. Thomas and St. Croix. If we were to build up our local airline and encourage seaborne also to come in on a reciprocity basis with a 4,600 runway, we could feed uh, free, feed into Beef Island from major airports around all the capacity of airlift that we need. What we need is more airlift. We don't need an ego-boosting 7,000-foot runway that's going to cost us a lot of money and is going to not be used, it under, will be underutilized for, forever, basically. Got gotcha. you. Uh, um, P.S. Just a minute, Mr. Hill. Let me just say straight up, I respectfully disagree with you. Let me just say that straight up. I hear you, and I hear you loud and clear, but I respectfully disagree. And I, I'm a platinum member on American Airlines for the last five, six years myself. I understand exactly what you're talking, and, and we have studied all of those issues. The airport is not just about big, bringing in bigger aircraft and necessarily bringing in more people. It's about accessibility. And I said earlier, for those who didn't hear me, the airport is also a sovereignty issue. We are building a nation, and a nation has to have certain characteristics that determines its sovereignty. You can't have in the United States of America, there was a big uproar when it was discovered about privatizing seaports, that the major owner of those seaports was a Dubai-based company, and it never went through because it was a sovereignty issue. Let us understand that. So building the airport is not an ego trip on anybody's part. So I respectfully disagree with what you're saying. We're building an airport 
because we have come to a point where we understand that if our country is going to grow, we have to have access to the wider world, not depending on St. Thomas and St. Croix, which are United States countries, but having access to the outside world. We have to understand that. And Mr. Helm, I'm sure you could appreciate this. And for all of those who are paying attention, that even with the airport that we have now, that the number of private jets that fly into B. Island has increased almost exponentially in recent years. And we are limited by the number of private jets that can fly into B. Island primarily because of the insurance issue. So we can't have commercial private jets because NetJet, which is the major privately owned commercial jet, does not allow their jets to fly into the BVI because it does not meet insurance standards. So all of the private jets that you see on Beef Island are privately owned. So we are not even getting that commercial traffic as we speak. So I'm saying all of that to put it in perspective that this is not about some ego trip on the part of this government or the past government. It is a, a, a position that we as a people have come to where we understand that for the future development of our country, just like when Mr. Stout started to build the college, there were doomsayers in their saying saying the BVI never needed a college. But we, we were thinking, we are thinking down the road 20, 25, 50 years that we are building a nation and a sovereign nation that has to have certain characteristics about it. But we are going to do our best to ensure that we mitigate against the negatives to ensure that the project is done in the best possible way for the benefit of all those who come and go from the BVI. Get a mic, get a mic. With, with the, Minister Pickering, with respect, um, I have done some research on behalf of clients, not here but in other places also, on NetJet and what they can fly in, and I take your point, and I advocate that we do extend Beef Island runway. I'm not disputing that with you. I'm disputing that the need for 7,000 feet. That is all. I'm, only, I'm not disputing the need for it. Okay. Point, your point is well taken, and I think that's debatable. I don't have a problem with that. And um, what if, what, 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 the, the reality is, let's be realistic about it, please. The no, I, I'm, is, I'm on the same page with that. You can't leave the BVI, right? You can't leave the BVI, basically, other than going through the U.S. Virgin Islands, unless you want to sail your own, own boat over to St. Martin. I mean... We are geographically tied by an umbilical cord to the United States. This is the reality of it. We're also tied to the U.S. Virgin Islands by uh, family connections and everything else. I'm very proud that when I walk through customs and immig immigration in, in St. Thomas, I walk in with my Virgin Islands passport and I have a right of entry because I'm a citizen of this country and I'm allowed entry into the US, the former Danish West Indies. I'm very proud of that fact. It doesn't diminish my status that they recognize me as a citizen of a country. And, and you know, the point about whether it's 6,000, as my colleague there, Honorable Flax, is saying, whether 7,000, 8,000, I think those are debatable points. I don't think we have any disagreement about that. And ultimately, the env environmental impact assessment may very well tell us that 6,300 feet might be the optimal because as we get all prohibitive, that we can't go to 7,000 feet. So 7,000 feet is not cast in stone. Just want you to understand that. 